at stake. They'll be the world's last hope. And the game is on. gentlemen. Welcome to They Called Us a Movie, testing the strength of friendships one terrible movie at a time. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and other podcast services by searching They Called Us a Movie. We are part of the Main Demi Network. And to find more from us, check out the website at themaindemi.com or on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at The Main Demi. We are also now a proud member of Geek Fives Nation. You can find them at gbnation.com. Welcome back to They Called Us a Movie. This is Anthony Delvecchio, and with me as always is Dan Aquino and Mark Myers. Say hello, gentlemen. Hey, guys. How's it going? Hello. I think I realized at some point watching this movie that you can see the exact moment when Sean Connery wanted to quit acting. <laughs> really? You, you, so you can pinpoint the moment. I, I can't wait to hear it because I could not pinpoint it. Oh, man. Now he's going to have to think about it on the fly. Oh, we're going right. through it. <laughs> well, you know, obviously take your time was, as we go through yeah, it. It was when he uh, saw, watched the dailies and saw Stuart Townsend said Bomb Voyage. Oh, you <laughs> just spoiled moment? it. <laughs> Is that the moment? <laughs> That's the moment. That's a good question. When did he realize, man, I made a huge mistake on this movie? When Shane West walked in the room. Probably when they let a woman in. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they wrote that right to the oh, script. It's it probably, it probably more of when he was like, Oh, the shoots in Venice. So I'll go to Venice for three weeks. <laughs> and they're like, No, we're going to do it on a soundstage. He's like, Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> more is the pity. <laughs> Speaking of Venice, this movie makes Venice out to be super dreary and just <laughs> awful looking. Right? Yeah. It's supposed to be a beautiful city, and they make it look, you know, it looks like it's already it's... sunk to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> city of abandoned buildings apparently <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's like it's gary indiana now this brings up a good point that or a good question over under let's say 10 terrible sean connery impressions in this review well we've done two so far yep i'm gonna say i'm gonna go i'm gonna go the under you're gonna go under okay i'm gonna go the under i i, I would say under as well but i can't promise for myself because i i found myself while watching this movie just constantly repeating things back as sean connery <laughs> <laughs> we'll see we'll see i'm i'm curious what do you think mark yeah i was going to say under two because i attempted to do an impersonation when explaining to my mother what movie we were watching for this and it was terrible so <laughs> did I, just get really awkward because she didn't know what you were doing yeah she's like, at me, I'm like sean connery she's like oh i like roger Moore better it's like, <laughs> it's like okay Jeez, uh, before... that, that got aggressive. <laughs> yeah, 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 she, yeah, she probably thought League of Extraordinary Gentlemen was a Bond movie. <laughs> She's like, why don't you do Octopussy instead? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but before we get into the movie we're watching, what did you guys watch this week? I wanted to watch The Hunt for Red October to kind of keep in line with our Sean Connery theme, but that's not on Prime, so I watched Crimson Tide instead, which is, you know, just as good. I enjoyed it. Denzel Washington, Gene Hackman, uh, Viggo Mortensen's in it, Steve Zahn, a young Steve Zahn. <laughs> and then I watched Enemy at the Gate, and I think, oh, and I, I've been binging Cobra Kai. I'm on the second season right now. Nice. Yeah. So you watched, it. Movies, you watched movies that sound like Sean Connery could be in them, but on further <laughs> yeah. inspection, he's not. <laughs> You're right. Well, yeah, I thought to myself, well, I'm taking uh, the submarine aspect of Crimson Tide, and then I'm taking the Russian aspect of Enemy at the Gate, because Sean Connery is quote-unquote Russian in yeah. Hunt for Red October, and yeah, I just combined them. So it, it's kind of there, right? <laughs> it's close enough. Yeah, of course. So I'll, I'm going to count that as a win. What about you, Mark? No, I didn't uh, watch anything in particular. I was too busy recovering from our 24-hour stream beforehand and just relax and like I said, I watch more just videos for about video games on YouTube and play video games like you guys watch movies. So essentially nothing this week. I'll let you know when I watch them. 
That's not, <laughs> that's not the segment. <laughs> guys, Mark I just watched it. surprises something. us halfway through. Guys, guess what? I watched a movie. <laughs> I mean, we could, we could possibly do that. <laughs> just chime in. I did not watch any movies this week. I've watched a couple of series. We've been watching The Undoing, which is on HBO. It's Nicole Kidman and it's Hugh Grant. And they play a couple and there's a murder in like their Upper West Side hoity-toity kind of community. It's interesting. I feel like feel like there's going to be a twist that I'm not going to like, though. Nicole Kidman was dead the whole time. That's right. <laughs> That's why I go to every every show now. I go into thinking, all right. I assume everyone's dead. Tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. It'd, it'd probably watched, save you hours. Yeah. So we watched that. And we also watched, and this was actually a couple weeks ago. I never mentioned it. The Queen's Gambit on Netflix. How is that? It's really good. It doesn't seem like it'd be all that good because it's all about chess. I don't know chess from a hole in the ground. But Anya, Anya Taylor-Joy is the lead from The Witch. She's the, the main character in this. She's really good. Yeah. It made me like interested in maybe looking up how to play chess but then i just went on with my life <laughs> chess is actually think, kind of fun i think you mean new mutants on you taylor joy is what that what it is no. does anybody <laughs> remember that <laughs> oh, oh so remember on our last podcast loyal listeners we went back and we're saying how all of a sudden it's become this whole thing where everyone has a hot take on movies that are bad but then everyone decides, no, those movies are actually good. Mm-hmm. New Mutants has already started on that oh, no. that uh, road because I've been seeing very, you know, sporadically people complimenting New Mutants. I haven't seen New Mutants yet, but I've heard it's awful. And I've seen a couple tweets pop up like, oh, you know, like, they got this character right or we need more of this character. Eh, slow your roll there, man. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we need more of a movie that, you know, took 100 years to come out. Yeah. <laughs> if I had to guess, the movie we're going to cover this week is going to be a movie that people are going to be like, you know what? I love that movie. You, you're right. I'm assuming yeah. because, I mean, two of us here don't hate it. Mm-hmm. So that definitely means there's someone out there saying this movie rocks. It's so under undervalued and underappreciated. Like, no, it's it's appreciated as much as it should be appreciated. Yep. Which is very little. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm not in the camp that thinks Sean Connery should have quit acting because of it. <laughs> We're not talking welcome, welcome to Mooseport here. Oh, that's Gene Hackman, right? <laughs> that's Gene Hackman. Where it's just, wow, fuck this. Gene I don't understand. Hackman. Like, why does one movie do that to anybody? I guess when you hit 70, you're just like, do I really want to be on set for three months doing shit? <laughs> it's like yeah. i guess there's got to be a point where you're the roles that you're receiving aren't worth it anymore robert de niro hasn't entered that no. zone yet <laughs> no yeah. or maybe in connery and we'll never know because i i don't know if he did much public stuff after this but if it might have been if he saw some like mental decline coming you know maybe. over his last couple movies and was just like you know what just gonna back away I mean, you know. he seemed fine in this movie. He sounded like himself, from what it, I gather. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing with diseases like that. Nobody knew Michael J. Fox had any issues until, right. you know, he announced it. Mm-hmm. It's like Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Right. He just he stepped away, did it quietly, didn't really make a big fuss about it. Just, you know, I'm I'm 90. I'm getting out of here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Mark, why don't you introduce this yeah. week's movie? Yeah. So I... Uh, I picked the uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. My thought was, while we were choosing movies and had a couple of choices already, uh, Sean Connery had passed away. So I thought that we should do a some type of Connery movie, because we hadn't done any before, especially since he's one of the first actors that I remember um, that was a non-kids movie actor that I knew his name, because my grandfather was obsessed with the Bond movies. So there was a lot of From Russia With Love and, and Goldfinger and all playing in my house when I was growing up. So, and when I saw this was on Prime, I'm like, I was like, I haven't seen this since it came out. And this was also the movie that made him quit acting. So I want to see how incredibly awful it had to be for that. And I was disappointed a little bit that it was a little more competent than I was expecting for some of the things I've heard about it. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, we haven't done a Connery movie and, you know, have a little bit of a slight tribute episode to him. So... We'll probably cover some of his stuff in the future because there's plenty of stuff. 
<laughs> but yeah, that was it. I had to make two choices of two of the last three weeks. So kind of that was it. Not not much deeper than that. Okay. Yeah. What well, better way to to honor him by picking the movie that made him quit his uh, his craft? Well, that's what we do here. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, where are you coming from with League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? I have seen this movie a few times. I'd probably say five or six times. And wow. I'm yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm of that's the, astonishing. <laughs> I'm of the mindset that I don't hate this movie, and it's I don't purposely put it on. I I won't seek it out but what when channel it would, shows it? it it was usually on like tnt or uh tbs one of those channels so if this you know a, nothing else was on i'd watch it bomb this is a huge bomb that you just dropped on me five really? or six times yeah yeah, yeah I mean, again i think i watched it once in high school for one of those days where it was just like towards the end of the year and the teacher just put on league of extraordinary gentlemen Your English so teacher? i had yeah what's that it's, your English teacher? My, right, my, yeah. my English lit teacher, yeah. Yeah, who had probably had a hangover and was like... <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, oh, Dorian Gray, remember that guy and his thing? Yeah, sit down and watch the movie. So yeah, I, I've seen it a few times, obviously, and I, I don't know if we'll be friends anymore after this, <laughs> Anthony and I. But uh, yeah, I don't hate this movie. I, again, I don't love it. I'm not going to sit here and say it's a masterpiece or say that it's underrated because it's not a good movie. But... It has some, you know, it has some decent action scenes. I like Sean Connery for the most part, and yeah, I, I don't know. I, I've never really this movie. I would just kind of shut my brain off when I would watch it. I just feel like, oh, you know, it's on, whatever. I'm not doing anything. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I've never read the graphic novel, the uh, Alan Moore comic. I've never read that, so I don't know how good that one is compared to the movie. But I was looking at a list, and it's in his top ten apparently. Gotcha. So this is the first time I've ever watched this movie, and I don't hate it like I hated Outcast. I think the movie we watched last week is is worse. That was bad. But yeah, this is a a bygone era of circa 2000 movies that are just bland. Like everyone was trying to hit hit that that series of movies that they're gonna turn into just cash cows, and this is a huge misstep. I don't know who this movie is for because. Asking kids to go watch a movie about Alan Quartermain and Dorian Gray and Mina Harker and Captain Nemo. It's like, Jesus Christ, man. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this just seems like a misstep. It seems like someone that thought like, oh, that X-Men movie was nice. Well, this is the more, this is the smart people's X-Men in this. This seems like the asylum version of another movie that came out, you know? Like, so they, right, yeah. they respond with the Avengers. Well, the Avengers have Spider-Man, they've got Iron Man, they've got Thor. We need something. It was like, and they just look to see what's in public domain. Like, well, we right. have Alan Quartermain, Captain Nemo, <laughs> a, a vampire lady. Now we can't do the Invisible <laughs> Man, but we could try and work around the Invisible Man. <laughs> and that's what they came up with. And the this cast is almost more or less be the same, minus Sean Connery. Right. This is essentially the uh, the West Coast Avenger, you know. It's just a bunch of nobodies, really. Well, like, uh, you know, we we stick the rejects over here, and that that's what they are. They're just a bunch of rejects. Yeah. No, I don't think anyone was ever really interested in the Invisible Man to that point, or Dorian Gray. And then you chose like you chose the least interesting character from Dracula to put in the movie. Right. Why couldn't you get Van Helsing? Because they're, they're doing not... a movie next door <laughs> called Van Helsing. Van Helsing. Yeah. Well, you could have started the Van Helsing verse there. Yeah. That would have I been mean... so much better. You had Hugh Jackman in there. Come on. Yeah. This was the same era, right? So like all these movies that came out, yeah. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Van Helsing, Underworld, yeah. all kind of similar in their like very medium draw to them. Right. Uh, Van Helsing came out in 2004, so the year after this. Year after this. When did Underworld yeah. come out? And those two movies had. Uh, would have been the year before the original. 2003, same year. Yeah. Yeah. God, can you imagine how much better that would have been? Not much, but better. <laughs> <laughs> Just like where people thought the CG they had was really great, so they were like, "We're gonna use the CG as all the time for everything," <laughs> and then it's just like, 
three years later is like, man, we made some we made some poor choices. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Dan, there was no way that Van Helsing, Hugh Jackman's Van Helsing would have been in this because, you know, Sean Connery was not going to allow anybody from the prison colony to uh, be in his movie. <laughs> Those dirty Australians. <laughs> Terrible. There's three. <laughs> well, no, that's not true because uh, Peter Peter Wilson is Australian. Mina Harker's I, Australian. I know that was kind of it, but no. Oh, okay. Well, I thought she's a woman, so he's like. You're you're a, I mean, Alan Quartermain had a hard time with that. He did, mm-hmm. and I don't know if that's like in canon with Alan Quartermain. Yeah. Or if that's just Sean Connery being Sean Connery. <laughs> Listen, Mina, if you need a smack, I'll give it to you. It's four. Four. <laughs> <laughs> Dan's gonna to get to the over himself. Yeah. I'm not gonna press it. I'm not. I'm only gonna do it when it matters. I'm not gonna just sit here and all of a sudden start doing, you know, rattling off Sean Connery impressions. Yeah. That's a it's disservice like, to the podcast. It's also like the bygone era when they, people tried to make steampunk a thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow and this. You, you know what's pretty damning about this movie? What? I've been to several comic cons and i don't think i've ever seen someone dress up as alan quartermain because <laughs> everyone always just mistakes them for indiana jones i guess <laughs> yeah it's dr jones <laughs> no i'm alan quartermain man <laughs> the oh, guy that indiana jones was based off <laughs> yeah. George Lucas stole the idea from it <laughs> well that's got to be so depressing for someone who's trying to, to dress up as alan quartermain right <laughs> Just like, oh, you're Indiana Jones' dad. No, that's not what I'm okay. trying to go for. <laughs> well, yeah, whatever. After like the tenth time, okay. 1981. Yeah, that's what I am. Bunch of Alan Quartermain stands, just the hearts broke when they saw Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's like it's over. <laughs> yeah. Never totally go stole back. His shit. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, imagine being such a literary nerd that you knew all these characters and all these stories, and going, oh man, they're gonna put them all in the same movie. It's gonna be great. And they then this is the movie you get. <laughs> there was probably yeah. like two people yeah. out there who felt that way. Yeah. Wearing his Dorian Gray t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. You all laughed at me. But now who's <laughs> laughing? Then he walks outside, just takes it off and throws it in the trash. Yeah. It says, let's get wild, but it's spelled with an E at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, that, that story, that just reminded me of an actual story. I wish that happened because when... Godzilla King of the Monsters came out. Uh, Jen and I went to go see it opening night. And I was wearing, I had a Godzilla t-shirt on. As we're walking in, someone's walking out. And the guy goes, don't even bother, man. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, okay, yeah. Let me let me just turn right around, stranger. I, I wonder, like, do you think that would have happened? Like some guy walking in to see League of Extraordinary <laughs> Gentlemen with his, you know, Alan Quartermain shirt or whatever. Like, don't even bother, kid. This movie sucked. Just broke his heart. <laughs> oh no! And who, who, like, Captain anyone... Nemo's good in it, right? <laughs> they did him justice. <laughs> or what about? Yeah, they well, made yeah, him well... a kung fu pirate. <laughs> oh, no. What about that guy that just sits there the whole time, just like criticizing the characterization in oh, the movie? They did Quartermain oh. all wrong. Uh, Captain Nemo was, was taller in the books. <laughs> Jekyll never goes to Paris. This is stupid. <laughs> they just turned him into the Hulk. Yeah, boo. <laughs> boo. Boo. That's not that's not Hyde. That's not Hyde. Boo. Not our Hyde. <laughs> not our Hyde. Yeah, not, <laughs> hashtag not our Hyde. I think and we have a hashtag for the, we're not hashtag take... for the tweet. <laughs> it's uh but yeah, it's just, I can't imagine like that that guy probably felt so good about himself when he told me that like uh, King of the Monsters sucked. I just yeah. saved that guy, you know, two hours of his time. I'm the hero <laughs> here. We all don't wear cape. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Went home and told his wife, that movie fucking sucked, but I told these two people to not go see it, and I'm pretty sure that they listened. So, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen from 2003, directed by Stephen Norrington, who also directed Blade. And then after this movie, he vowed to never direct another movie, and he still hasn't. Wow, I, so Blade was actually good. Yep. Blade's a good movie. So like this hap- this is what happens, man. Sometimes you direct a good movie, sometimes you don't. <laughs> According to the trivia, he was displeased with just the entire process of being a director. But otherwise, he was a special effects artist, including work on Aliens, Aliens 3, and Exorcist The Beginning. Hmm. It stars Sean Connery, 
Nasruddin Shah, Peter Wilson, Tony Curran, Stuart Townsend, Shane West, Jason Fleming, Richard Roxburgh, Max Ryan, Tom Goodman Hill, David Hemmings, and Terry O'Neill. IMDb score of a 5.8 and a Rotten Tomato score of 17%. Budget, $78 million. Box office, 66.4. So it did not make say, that, say those numbers again, I'm sorry. Budget, 78 mil. Box office, 66.4. It made its money back okay. overseas, but... Okay. Obviously in England. Yeah. No, I, I would say in Africa, right? I'm sure. Yeah. Sure, the yeah, African yeah, market was huge. South, yeah, yeah. That, that's Kenya. why they made it that, that yeah, way. In exactly. Kenya, yeah. Specifically Kenya. I was just surprised that Peter Wilson uh, did other things besides La Femme Nikita. Because that, <laughs> that, that is the, like I said, you guys in the, in the pre-stream. There are only two people from my entire childhood that I remember from the USA Network. And one was Peter Wilson and La Femme Nikita and Rob Estes and Silk Stalkings because they were advertised constantly during Monday Night Raw. Yep, I, I do remember those nights. Like, <laughs> my oh, mom would never let me watch those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember specifically, like, oh, can I stay up and watch that? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> not for your young eyes, young man. Yeah, that was like, it was like our first introduction to porn. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> yeah, that opening to Silk Stalking. Like, oh, I don't even remember what it was. I'm just assuming that it was. It was really- the leg in the in the stock of putting oh, the yeah, stocking right. on. Come on. I think, I think that's what really made my mom upset. Was like, first of all, it sounds very, you know, very raunchy. Silk stockings, ooh. And then it had the the actual leg in the stocking. So it was like, you know, no, definitely not. You can't watch that. But you could watch wrestling where, you know, women are flashing and because it, it was the Attitude Era. So. Yeah. Now, Ann, I don't know if you looked up the trivia or anything on this, but correct me if I'm wrong. When I was looking up stuff for this, I think, wasn't she offered Jean Grey for X-Men? I... I don't know. Did it? Would it have said that in League Extraordinary General? No, it might have been hers. Oh. Might have been like the first thing on hers. Mm, but no. I was surprised that you know, because again, I only knew her from that show. I'm like, oh, she, apparently people wanted her for other stuff at that time. Man, for the, for the longest no time, I thought she was the girl from that '70s show. Was it a uh, Laura Prepon? <laughs> yeah, very kind of similar, but I was like, oh, she's way too young in that, right? Yeah, this woman's. Yeah, she's probably. She wasn't that much older, though, I guess. I, was, I, I honestly don't remember. She was a little over 30. I mean, I guess that's still 10 years difference, probably, mm-hmm. for Laura Preppen, or whatever her name was. She's yeah. still alive. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What her name was. <laughs> uh, it, uh, spe- speaking of Kenya, did anyone notice how the bad guy says Kenya in this movie? Nope. Kenya? Kenya. Kenya? That's not the correct pronunciation, right? I have no idea. All right. I, I don't want to go around saying you know, my whole life I've been saying Kenya and it's actually Kenya. Yeah. It's like I just learned that I was saying Nevada wrong the whole time. It's Nevada. Nevada. It's actually Nevada. Yeah. It's Nevada. Oh. No, that don't, that don't, they don't deserve a, <laughs> oh, they do. They do. They do. Yeah. Never mind. You're yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll start calling them that. It's like, it's like damn Houston moving to New York, <laughs> confusing everybody when the street gets named after him. <laughs> Houston street. I was guilty of that. I have to go to Houston Street. Houston Street? Where the hell's that? <laughs> you guys want to get into the plot? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. All right, Dan, what do you got? All right, you guys know the deal. Going to talk about our friend Tia and her podcast, Top 10 with Tia. It is a weekly podcast where Tia and her friends get together and discuss Top 10 lists. You can follow her on Twitter at TC underscore Stark. You can find her podcast there. And she's also a member of Geek Vibes Nation, so follow her there she does a lot of great articles and whatnot she's a good friend of the podcast so check her out okay and we are going to take a quick break but before we do we're going to take a second to listen to some messages from friends of the podcast so we will be right back hey this is ken m padawan j coach duffy from the ocho duro parlay hour podcast Every week, the ODPH is talking sports, movies, TV, comics, and more. It's always a parlay of topics on each episode. You can find the ODPH on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, and wherever you find great podcasts, such as the one you're listening to right now. Don't forget to check out OchoDuroParlayHour.com, where you can find the links to all of the ODPH social media accounts, links to the bands whose music you hear each week on the show, hashtag 607 podcast info, and parlay points, our companion block section of the show. Thanks for listening to the ODPH. Now get back to your regularly scheduled podcast. Welcome, travelers. Seems like you're looking for a story. 
Well, I got one for you. It involves adventure, friendship, and all hey, sorts hey, of... Hey, uh, hey, Earl, why don't you tell him about that time I stole that big-ass melon? Yeah, yeah, I, I was going for more... Or you could tell him about the time I kicked your ass, Earl. I wouldn't ever tell him Do I need to get time. my ref gear on? Okay, everyone, shut up. Now come with me as I tell you a story from afar. Hey everybody, my name's David. I'm the DM for From Afar Podcast. A From Afar Podcast is all about four friends separated by distance, brought together by adventure. Hope you all stop by and give us a listen. Thanks. And welcome back, and now it's time to get into the plot of The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. We open on 1899 London, as the Bobbies get alerted to something as police dogs race towards the street. As they turn a corner, they see some sort of tank rise up from out of the ground, tearing off towards the Bank of England, running over basically anyone who gets in its way. As the authorities fruitlessly shoot at the tank as it smashes through the wall after wall of the bank, it eventually makes it to the vault. Three quick smashes with some sort of weapon, the vault doors cave in. Now it steps Germans, and they collect everything in the vaults, including some sort of plans. London newspaper claims it was the Germans. Wasn't there like a second newspaper that popped up that says, Germany says, no, it is not us. Not me. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Uh, That's newsworthy. Yeah, I am a sucker for poorly photoshopped newspapers. That's a Simpsons headline. Then we got to Berlin in 1899 as a masked man starts rounding up German scientists. And he shoots a rocket at a bunch of Zeppelins, which then explode. And then German newspaper claims it was London. Then... Europe on the brink of war, two decades before World War II. So we got the Kenya. A man in a suit arrives at some sort of embassy. He approaches a man whom he believes is Alan Quartermain. He introduces himself as Sanderson Reed, and he represents the British government. Turns out he's talking to the wrong man because Quartermain is right next to the other guy. So he introduces himself to Reed. Reed tells Quartermain about the situation in Europe and that he needs Quartermain to lead a team of men. He then tells Reed that those days are behind him, and then just then, a team of guys and dusters come in and kill the guy that was pretending to be Quartermain earlier, and then Quartermain kills one of them, and also a gunfight starts. So these guys have armor and automatic rifles. Quartermain does a good job of punching them, hitting them with tables, and running one through with a taxidermied rhino. At some point, it became slightly slapstick comedy, the fight in this, like putting them inside that rack or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, so they could go fight the other ones, just so you could have an excuse for... 60 or 70 year old, probably 70 year old at this point, Sean Connery could get from one guy to the other without getting killed. Yeah, they're definitely doing, they're shooting around the fact that he's 70. It's <laughs> yeah. it's kind of obvious oh, yeah. in all the action scenes that he's doing. There's like, he's got one move and that's punching people at this <laughs> point. He's not going to lift his legs to kick. Yeah. He's yeah. just, just going to punch. <laughs> well, he he's a man's man. Men punch. There's no kicking in fights, right? Just, I don't think he's ever thrown a kick. Just these babies. Got his knuckles right. all lined up. He's a brawler. Exactly. If there's nothing that can't be solved with two fists, he hasn't met it yet. <laughs> I know they really didn't care about this, but the fact that you have a movie that you've advertised, Sean Connery is in it, and you try to play this per- deception game that the man that is looks like Sean Connery behind the guy yep. is... <laughs> <laughs> like that's that's the worst part is that they have him in the shot <laughs> right it's not like he's directly behind him yeah it's like well clearly it's sean connery they're not going to cast sean connery in this in this movie and not have him talk <laughs> well, he really got us there movie <laughs> which movie in his later career was he wearing a kilt was that the avengers yeah with uma thurman yeah yes i believe so and he's also he also dresses up as a teddy bear i believe that's a wild movie that we might have to cover one day. <laughs> yeah, that movie was pretty bad, I've heard. Yeah, we'll probably say, oh, I didn't hate it. No, I've never seen it, so. <laughs> That'll be me. <laughs> yeah. From what uh, I've heard, it's pretty bad. So then one of the guys tries to r- escape through the Kenyan outback, but Quartermain wings him with a long-distance shot from a rifle. A couple of guys bring him back. The guy swallows a cyanide pill and dies. And then a bomb he set at the e- embassy explodes. And Quartermain says to Reed, he's in. Which is pretty much, if you think about it, that whole scene really makes no sense. All right. Why wound the guy if he's immediately going to take the cyanide pill? Well, his plan was that he was going to question him. That's fine. That's fine and all in real life. But yeah. in, in terms movie, of movie, in terms yeah. of movie, it's like, yeah, you don't need that. It would have been just cooler if he killed him. Yeah. Yeah. Because he runs up as they put him up. was like, don't, don't let him do that. Uh, and, right. You know, before he puts the pill in his mouth. He hobbles over. Yeah. <laughs> I need information. Five, five. Five. 
So then we cut to July 1899 and Quartermain arrives in London. Reed brings him into headquarters and he meets M and Captain Nemo. M briefs Quartermain. The attacks are the work of the Phantom with an F. The Phantom has created the machines, now intends to sell them to the highest bidder. Quartermain then meets the Invisible Man. Not the real one, though, because that's the only character that was not in the public domain. <laughs> I never so knew that. Just... I was curious as to why they made such a big deal, like, oh, that other guy died. Yeah. This is a new Invisible Man. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> Who cares? But now it makes more sense. He's not the Invisible Man. He's an Invisible Man. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's why I didn't realize the how careful they worded it. Carefully they worded it. It's like, oh no, it's not the Invisible Man. It's he's just an Invisible Man. His name is Skinner in this movie. And then we meet Wilhelmina Harker from Dracula. Quartermain is not happy to be working with a woman. <laughs> Again, we don't know if this is the book. Like Alan Moore actually wrote that, you know, like and Alan Quartermain is disgusted by a woman, mm-hmm. or if it's just like Sean Connery, like I didn't want this at all. Yeah. I, I've worked with plenty of women. They've always been a distraction. And that's the thing. Like he's very presumptuous. He's like, I you know, I've buried many lovers and wives, and I'm not ready to do it again. Like, oh, well, relax, dude. All right. <laughs> Who's saying she's going to jump your bones here? You're you're pretty old now. Like, we get <laughs> it. You're Sean Connery. You're like the sexiest man alive at one point, but times have changed, dude. <laughs> yeah, not in 2003. <laughs> right. Or 1899, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the times have changed. It's not, you know, it, 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 Wilhelmina Harker's not getting ready to just go to town on you. <laughs> and then they go collect more people for the team. Because Captain Nemo has his first mate Ishmael drive them in an automobile. I was telling the guys prior to recording how well, everyone's fascinated by the automobile that they they make sure to tell you. But it's 1899 this movie is set. The first automobile came out in 1886, so a full decade earlier. And like, no one's heard about this stuff. <laughs> I, like, I'd understand if it had just come out. Like, oh, you know, maybe word hasn't traveled yet, but... It's been 10 years. I I think we would have made drastic improvements in that time on the automobile and everyone would know about it, especially in London. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, fun fact. Peter Wilson, who plays Mina Harker, replaced Monica Bellucci, who was originally cast in that. Hmm. I don't think it would have mattered. No, probably not. Right. Pretty throwaway character. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, this moment with, with the Ishmael reveal was, do you think if it was shown in a room full of Moby Dick fans that they... It was an applause line. Well, like, little known fact, the reason why Alan Moore got into writing was because of Moby Dick. So he needed Ishmael in this movie. Got it. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> we'll go with it, Dan. I He's a wizard. Ever, so. if, I hope if they ever like round up a whole bunch of Moby Dick fans, they just like fill the room with water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fill them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First of all, in 2021, I doubt there's any Moby Dick fans. <laughs> If a, if a if a politician runs on putting Moby Dick fans in a room and filling it with water, that guy's got my vote. Yep. Again, I don't know if there's any holdout Moby Dick fans. You know, John Fetterman, if you're listening, <laughs> Fetterman 2028. Is, is that's the way to get him? That that's the way he gets your vote. Yep. Kill all the Moby Dick fans. What do you have against Moby Dick? <laughs> Did you have to do a report on it? You didn't do well. I mean, no, but if someone was like, you know what what book I really love is Moby Dick? It's like, fuck that person, honestly. Really? Man, that, that's, I mean, it's a literary classic. Have you read it? I have. I have you? It. Yeah, I, oh, am I, I'm dropping all these bombshells on Anthony. Yeah. Ooh, hold on one second. <laughs> you mean to tell me. You read a book, Dan? <laughs> you read one of the most famous books of all time. I, I, I've never read it, and I, I'd be caught dead. I'd be in that room with the Moby Dick fans before I read that book. <laughs> You're a strange guy. <laughs> You're a strange guy, Ant. You really are. You, you hate children, and you want to punch children in the face, and you hate Moby Dick. Yeah. And and you love There Will Be Blood. You're a weird guy. <laughs> what can I tell you, man? Just wailing. <laughs> you how, It's wailing, man. Let those whales be free. Yeah, no, listen, I am 100% <laughs> on board with that. I am anti-whale ing. I like whales. <laughs> You're anti-whale. Man, so brave <laughs> to come out on this podcast. Got to got whale. whale. <laughs> got to nuke something in, all right? Touche. Touche. <laughs> I like whales. I love whales. I was rooting for the whale to swallow that woman in the video. Did you see that video? <laughs> no. Oh, there was a kayaker in like in the bay or something like that, and a, like a giant beluga whale or something came up and almost swallowed this woman. 
are you going to tell me next that your some of your best friends are whales? Yeah, I would say some of them are. <laughs> I'm a big fan of whales. They are very smart creatures. All right, but yeah. So essentially, what I'm saying here is, I don't think that there are any Moby Dick fans when they made this movie. Yeah, I think you're yeah. one of 20 people that have read it that are still alive. Yeah, yeah. They're still oh, alive. <laughs> that, that's just gonna. I'm gonna be the old coot. You know, 30, 40 years from now. Tell when, we're, when we're in a Book of Eli situation, you're, I hope you remember Moby Dick, because you're going to be the one. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the precious cargo, Moby Dick. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm just a whale lands. again. <laughs> I, have to, I have to get this across the country. What is it? It's Moby Dick. I'm just imagining the disappointment uh, from the writer when he goes and sees the opening weekend of this movie and going, honey, wait, here comes the line. They're going to love it. And everyone. And then there's just silence. (laughs) Call me Ishmael. Boo. (laughs) It's that old couple behind you that's there for some reason, and they're like, "Oh, it's like the it's like Moby Dick." (laughs) (laughs) Call me Ishmael. That's my favorite line from the book. Oh, wake up. (laughs) Well, it's it is the most famous line from the book, I'd imagine, right? I mean, everyone knows that. Yeah, because yeah. it's a classic, Anthony. All right. And, and those people would probably be the worst people to be sitting in front of in this movie. No, that's the that title still goes to Frankenstein's The Doctor. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, that's still people. they own that. Now, Actually, if you wanted to drown those people, Anthony, I am fully on board. I mean, you know, that's it's a probably a good sized room. I'm sure, we yeah. could fit those people in there. Okay, that yeah. What are we saying? Like a. Uh, what kind of room are we talking about here? Like a conference room? Yeah, or like a movie theater, because we're not using those anymore. That's true. So, so are we turning movie theaters into just like death rooms now? Yeah, Okay. I think so. AMC would probably jump at the chance. Look, I mean, I think I think there's a future in that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to side with this one. I'm going to bring back the guillotines, baby. Public hangings? Yeah, get <laughs> that <headings>. guy. <laughs> anyway... They wind it's up at the do- turn. They, they wind up at the London docks at the home to the home of Dorian Gray. Gray brings them into his library and they talk specifically so they can say that Dorian Gray doesn't age. I'm assuming because the average theater goer doesn't know the Dorian Gray story. Suddenly, a group of guards surround them and Phantom shows up, asking them to join him and his plan for a world war. And then one of the guards winks at Quartermain in an act of allegiance and then fires on the other guards. Then a gunfight ensues and a league of extraordinary gentlemen gets to show off their skills. Dorian Gray is a master fencer that can't die. Nemo knows martial arts for some reason. And Quartermain <laughs> is a brawler. One of the things that annoyed me was the bad guys all have automatic machine guns. They have machine guns. Mm-hmm. None of the good guys have machine guns. And they are never outgunned. Nope. It's madness even nemo who has a fucking sword is not outgunned <laughs> this is just one of those things where the heroes are so good and powerful they don't even need to be on the same yeah. level of weaponry as their opponents right I, again quartermain's taking out guys with his fists who are armor plated with machine guns like yeah like, he might as well just be superman <laughs> Then the Phantom makes a break for it. The guard that killed the other ones is in hot pursuit, but eventually the Phantom escapes through a window. There are teamer groups in the library, but then another guard pops up and tries to take Mrs. Harker hostage, but then she turns into a vampire and kills him. The other guard introduces himself as Tom Sawyer Secret Service. Uh, and a wild chain west appears. And every... <laughs> <laughs> this is very 2003 where Shane West yeah. has a career. Quartermain tells him that he's part of the team and they got to go recruit one more guy in Paris. So Nemo shows off his water vessel, the Nautilus, which is an enormous submarine. It's funny. He, uh, when he points out that they have to get to Venice in three days. So Sawyer goes like, that's impossible. And Nemo says, you underestimate the Nautilus and they don't even make it in time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They're late. Yeah. They're late. You, like they show up right when the bombs are going off. Like, well, I guess I would I would have loved for Sawyer to be like, I guess I didn't underestimate it, did I, jackass? <laughs> and I and I also have the fact that they have decided to take this gigantic oversized ship from London to Paris. Right. Again, I mean, this is 1899. This is almost like Wild Wild West, giant spider territory. There was nothing that big in 1899. <laughs> it's like so impractical. So they go to Paris and. They, so Quartermain and Tom Sawyer go stomping around the streets of Paris, trying to track down what they call a giant monkey as he stomps around the rooftops. Eventually, they capture him in a net and drag him into a holding cell of the submarine. And 
Quartermain mentions that this is Mr. Hyde. On the ship, Mr. Hyde is basically the Hulk, chained up, but could basically just knock everyone out if he wanted to. Quartermain offers him a chance to return home in exchange for his help, and he agrees, then he turns back into Dr. Jekyll. Do you think any of them knew, like, what Jekyll did? I don't think so. Because in the book, he's like a rapist and a murderer. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it is the English crown, so they've done a lot of terrible deeds, yeah. but allowing amnesty to a rapist and a murderer probably isn't a good look. Yeah, I mean, there, it's not, <laughs> there's no accident for why there's a whole lot of Englishmen in Kenya. Right, yeah, God, <laughs> God save the queen. They, that's, they, that's the whole thing that's going on there. So, yeah, it's they didn't do that nicely, I'd imagine. Then they set off for Venice and have three days to get there. As they travel, everyone starts coming on to Mrs. Harker. <laughs> <Thank wants, God. laughs> it's like, oh, now we have time to breathe. Let's all just try and fuck the closest woman then. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I don't think there's another woman in the entire movie. Yeah, I mean, there might be some women extras. Or oh, there's again. one other, and it's the woman who is recording the message from the Phantom. Oh, right. That's yeah. the only woman, I think. So there's yeah. two women in this entire movie. Yeah, besides extras, yes. Yeah. Because yeah, I'm sure there's carnival extras, too. Probably. But yeah, I, I didn't even realize, like, man, like, as soon as they're out of danger, everyone wants in on Mina Harker. Yep. Jekyll just meets her. And he's already fighting with himself to, like, not, you know, like, I shouldn't rape Mina. That's probably <laughs> something I should not do. Sawyer puts the moves on her, like, super blatantly, as only an American would, really. Yeah. He's He was essentially, like, like trying to send her a dick pic on the boat. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think the only person who doesn't want to bang her is Quartermain. He just wants to beat the shit out of her. I mean, it, probably both. Right. <laughs> Maybe that's his move. So I'm gonna slap her so she she right. realizes that I'm a man. <laughs> I'm Alan Bloody Quartermain. Six six. <laughs> <laughs> As they travel, everyone starts coming up to Mrs. Harker. Nemo tells them what Phantom stole, and it includes the blueprints for the Venice Canal. So they assume they're going to attack by sea. And at night, as Quartermain looks over some info, he realizes the Invisible Man is in his room and he kicks him out. Scene goes nowhere. Then he has a conversation with Nemo, apologizing for calling him a pirate. Then in the morning, Quartermain talks with Tom Sawyer about why he left England. He says that he lost his son on one of his adventures. Then he tells Sawyer that he needs to learn how to shoot. So they shoot at some targets while they uh, travel to to Venice. He's teaching him how to shoot long range Mm -hmm. with, I guess, the, the buoys. Sawyer never hits anything. Nope. He only shoots once, but then this comes back later in the movie. Yep. And you know, like when we get there, I'll explain why that's a big deal. And the Invisible Man scene is essentially is like a red herring to yeah. what's going to happen in the next couple scenes. You've seen The Boys, right? Yeah. No, I have uh, not. So Translucent, essentially, yeah. is the Invisible Man. So he he's pulling like a reverse Translucent. He's spying on Quartermain, where Translucent spies on the women's bathroom. So, I was I was thinking, you know, like there's always the question of like, if you had any superpower, what would it be? Mm-hmm. Anyone says invisibility, that person is not a good person. Nope, no, they're because there is nothing good you could do with invisibility. No, like, yeah, what like I mean, <laughs> unless you're a spy for the government, right? I and mean, that's, that's that's iffy whether or not that's good or not. Right. <laughs> I mean that that is very that's a total gray area. But yeah, you're either gonna spy on women or men, or you're gonna rob people. Yep. Right. <laughs> yeah. Or you're like an assassin. And There's no guy, lawful good use of. And Skinner probably does all three. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's possible. But I, <laughs> I mean, mean like, he does sexually woman. assault her. He does. Yeah, he grabs her butt. The Invisible Woman is a good guy, but she was more for like espionage. You know, like oh, we, we have to go turn off that switch, but I can't get in there because there's a bunch of cameras. I'm like, all right, go ahead, Invisible Woman, and sneaks in. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> most of the time if you choose invisibility you're a creep yep so then sawyer tries to shoot they shoot at some targets and then later nemo finds some powder and harker identifies it as substance substance used in photography flashes she then has a conversation with dorian gray and explains the story of the picture of dorian gray a portrait of dorian gray then dorian offers her a drink and she breaks the glass in her hand and so she gets all horny over blood and they fuck yeah Literary characters fucking. Yeah. This is like fanfic. Yeah. That's a good point. It what if is. Doreen Gray fucked Mina Harker? It would be super boring. Yep. A lot of be mission. Yeah, and like probably like a lot of lace. And a lot of one-liners. 
and bodices and boudoirs. Yeah. Now, if she goes to bite Dorian Gray, like there's no blood in him. He's he's like sand, right? Like because they show in the fight scene the one uh, the one soldier like shoots them all up, and they make a point to pull down his shirt so you can see the bullet. He he does the Wolverine. The the mm-hmm. bullets just disappear, but it's all sand. Yeah. So if she went to bite him, does sand come out? I don't know. It's a good question. Something that we're they gonna have to write answered. our fanfic about it. <laughs> right. She just sucked all the sand out of him. <laughs> From the dick. <laughs> God, imagine shooting sand. <laughs> oh, it's coarse. It gets everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to live if that's what I was shooting. It's not even worth it. It just feels terrible. <laughs> there's, there's like a moment of like happiness followed by just immense pain and discomfort. <laughs> so, so you before the one chip challenge then. Oh, God. <laughs> Never again, guys. Never, ever again. I didn't feel right the whole night. All the while, Dr. Jekyll watches and Hyde starts talking to him, being real shitty to Jekyll in an attempt to get out. Back in his room, Hyde realizes that one of his vials is missing and he thinks the Invisible Man took it. And then they arrive in Venice and search for bombs that the Phantom has placed. As Nemo's crew goes to search for the bomb, it's too late and the bombs go off and the city begins to fall into the sea. And the city, the buildings fall like dominoes. The plan is to destroy a building that will stop the domino effect. It's so, so this is a stupid idea. Stupid I don't know plan. if that works in real life, does it? Yeah. Because it's, it's bombs. I, I don't, I didn't really understand the plan other than they're just trying to stop the domino effect. They're trying to blow up one building so it, it stops one building from knocking over the other. I, I guess I, to me that I've always heard that works for fires, right? right. If you, if you stop the chain the fire can't jump to the next house. Right. But yeah, I don't know if that's how it works for bombs going off in the foundation of a city. Not sure. I don't know. I'm not a terrorist, so. Yeah. Yeah. You've heard it here first. (laughs) Dan Aquino, not a terrorist. (laughs) Jumping out on that branch real quick. One person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter, Dan. Don't forget that. That's true. I don't know if he was (laughs) fighting for, like he specifically said he was trying to start a war, so. Right. And no one's ever accused you of being a freedom fighter. No, no. Uh, I'm usually, <laughs> I'm running away from conflict. <laughs> I guess that you're in the clear for being a terrorist then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm way too much of a coward to to start any kind of war or help anyone in a war. Going back into the annals of history, if there was ever a, an Aquino clan somewhere, they were not fighting. There's no <laughs> way they were fighting. So they have to find a pick a building that will stop the domino effect. So in order to find it, Tom Sawyer starts hot rodding in Nemo's car and Quartermain and Harker jump in with Dorian Gray too. I don't know how they pick the building. They just pick a building. I guess, start, yeah, that's a good point. They, they, they got to really get ahead that. of the explosions. That's what that's that's the the picking. So they start driving through the city and some snipers start shooting at them. So Gray jumps out and Harker turns into a vampire and kills some. Quartermain then jumps out and chases after Phantom. Sawyer drives through the town. He eventually gets to where he needs to be, so he sets off a flare, and the plan works. They set off some bombs from the Nautilus, and they blow up the bu- the building they need to, and it, the domino effect stops, and then Sawyer crashes the car. Quartermain then goes stomping around a cemetery looking for Phantom, and <laughs> we see Phantom, and to be honest, the more you see Phantom, the worse he looks. Yep, it's just... bad prosthetics. <laughs> Then Dorian Gray makes it back to the Nautilus and sees Ishmael cleaning up some sort of sabotage, and then he shoots Ishmael. Phantom and Quartermain then fight in the cemetery, and Quartermain knocks off Phantom's mask to reveal that he's actually M, the man that hired them, which I'm sure comes with a really stupid reason as to why someone would hire a group of operatives to foil his own plan. So right. Cor- <laughs> It's like Loki did, hiring did, the Avengers. Yeah. Did you write that note through your first viewing? So the first viewing, I paid no attention to it. That okay. was the day after Extra Life, so I basically fell asleep on it. <laughs> Hard to do with this movie. So Quartermain meets back up with Harker, Jekyll, Nemo, and Sawyer. Ishmael comes stumbling out of the Nautilus with just enough life left to tell them it was Gray that betrayed them. Then, Dorian Gray makes off with Captain Nemo's exploration pod in the dumbest sentence that I've ever written for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a it's a weird-looking escape okay. pod, too, right? Yeah. I don't know how it works. Yeah. I don't know. Looks like uh, a Langolier. It kind of does look like a Langolier. <laughs> then the League make it back to the ship, and one of Nemo's men finds a recording on vinyl. So they find a Victrola, and they play it, and it's a recording of Em and Gray explaining their whole plan. 
Meanwhile, Jekyll sees Hyde in his reflection, begging him to shut off the recording. They reveal that Gray has collected samples from each of them. The superhuman ones, anyway. He was like, nah, I don't really need anything from Quartermain or Sawyer. Fuck those guys. Well, Sawyer wasn't supposed to be a part of it. Yeah. They also reveal that the recording has been transmitting a high-frequency sound that is setting off bombs they planted on the Nautilus. <laughs> and then Dorian Gray says the worst line in this movie. Bomb voyage. And that is when Sean Connery walked off set. <laughs> <laughs> you really put this in the script? Seven. <laughs> it gives Arnold a run for his money, really. Yeah. Even Bomb. Arnold cringed. Bomb voyage, yeah. Just And how douchey. Like, if you're M and Dorian Gray walks in in the middle of your monologuing, you don't do that, right? <laughs> like, who the fuck let you in here, dude? I'm, yeah. I'm giving my speech here. You, you make your own recording. And yeah, he have drops to, that line. It, was, it had to be pre-written too, right? He probably thought of it like, oh man, this is really going to get them. <laughs> right. He didn't come up with that right off the top of his head while they were recording. No, yeah, he's he had it clearly thought out. I'm going to diss the League. I'm going to tell them that they didn't even exist. Then I'm going to tell them what's really going on. But mm-hmm. then Dorian comes in and he starts doing all this like really shitty improv. <laughs> Growl. Growl. <laughs> what are you doing, dude? Like, I would have yeah. like, all right, hold, just stop it right there. Stop. Uh, hey, get uh, out. I've been taking classes, Em. <laughs> right. I'm fucking talking right now. <laughs> <laughs> Give me an animal, Em. Give me an animal. Oh, God. Hey, Dorian, please. I know you're, you know, you're 100, 200 years old, but you would think you would have learned manners in those times. <laughs> Why don't you get your own Victrola? Record right. your own message. All right, we can send two. It's fine. <laughs> you really want to talk so bad. <laughs> yeah. It's like, do you want to do this? <laughs> Did you want to detail my master plan to them? Yeah. It, we'll wait. We'll and wait. They, both of them have such shit eating grins on their faces. <laughs> so smug. Ugh. You think they're doing it? I, Dorian Gray is definitely, he swings both ways. Yes. He's 100% that way. And that's I, fine. I, I, even in the book. But is that how he is in the book? I mean, I know Oscar Wilde is, was gay. Okay, so you, you think he wrote it that way? Probably. I didn't, you know, living that many I years. I don't read nerd books. <laughs> Too busy hooking up with babes. <laughs> <laughs> to read Dorian Gray. Yeah, I would imagine it's one of those but, things where you live that long. You have you to. Know, you know. You get bored. Yeah. You right. got to sample all of life's fruits, essentially. Yeah, that's probably, eventually, you probably do reach an age where you're just like, I wonder what dick tastes like. Yeah, and you know what? <laughs> I, I'm i telling you right now, if I was around for centuries, I would 100% do it. I mean, it would be lower on the list of things that I want to experience. Sure. It would be one of those things where it's Groundhog Day, I'd learn piano, mm-hmm. I'd learn ice sculpting, I would learn a ton of things, and then one day, the day would just come when I'd wake up, Sonny and Cher is playing on the radio again. <laughs> Today is the day. I'm going to do this. I'm going to find that guy. I'm going to find out what it's what it's like. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of that, really. There's no, like, there's no, and then, it's just, today's the day, and <laughs> continue on. It makes perfect sense to me. Right? I mean, you have no choice after a while. Yeah. And I imagine, like, you've been alive 300 years and you realize that's what you really enjoy doing. I've I've wasted 300 years of my life not doing this. This is really me. I've been living alive for 300 years. That's got to be the worst feeling ever. Finally living my truth. Yeah. That would be, it would be great and heartbreaking at the same time. Right. The fact that you're immortal is like, all right, well, you know, really no harm done. But I've seen, but like so many of my loved ones have died and I could have blown them. Think of all the dicks you didn't suck. Exactly. <laughs> and he could have been great, but I, you know, I wasn't aware. I didn't know. <laughs> I guess there was more to that than. <laughs> well, yeah, then that's, that's it. Nope, there's more. There's always more. So the bombs go off and the Nautilus starts taking on water. And Hyde tells Jekyll that he needs to turn into him so he can help. So he does and goes down into the deepest part of the ship and releases the manual surfacing switch. And then the Nautilus goes back to the surface. The the manual switch, I think it was specifically made for Hyde. Right. <laughs> Those things are massive. Yeah. All right. I, no normal person could get their hand around the uh, switch, like the toggle. Yeah. <laughs> Those things were huge. Like that. Like we we better make it this big just in case we have uh, Hyde on board. Yeah. Only he could operate it. Yeah, they should have shown like them using it. Yeah. Real, real, like, oh well, we got two guys and we got a 
a crank or like a, a jack that that they use it. Right. I mean, those things are inhumanly big. Yeah. So he does, and they surface, and while they clean up the ship, they get a Morse code transmission. It's the Invisible Man. Uh, what was his name? Skinner? Skinner. He had stowed away on with Em and Gray, and he tells them the coordinates of where to find them. They wind up heading to Mongolia. They all get sweet winter outfits that make it look like it's the third level in Inception. They make it <laughs> some sort of base in the Mongolian mountains and hide out in a cave waiting for Skinner, the Invisible Man. Then a tiger shows up and then leaves. The Invisible Man shows up and sexually assaults Harkin. Harker. It seemed like in this scene, especially that tiger one, where they were like, well, we set this thing up earlier in the movie. We got to pay it off. You know, we can't just leave things hanging. Because Quartermain says, I think he says it's a Nemo, that, you know, old tigers, right before they die, they fight. They go out fighting. That's yeah, when they're out there most dangerous. dangerous. Yeah. yeah. They even mention it in this in this scene. Then Skinner info dumps what M's fortress looks like. Robots, multiple Nautilus, forced labor, and they're trying to create more of the superhuman people. So they plan to storm the fortress with plans to take M alive, free the prisoners, and destroy M's creation. So Skinner goes invisible and starts planting bombs. Nemo goes to release the prison scientists and their families. Sawyer and Qua- Quatermain go searching for M. Quatermain and Sawyer make it to the M's room. They get the jump on him, and it's revealed that he's James Moriarty. Oh, for man. I'm so pissed again. at this reveal. <laughs> nice you're going to tell me that you don't like Sherlock Holmes. No, it's the opposite. You I'm love like, Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Yeah, it would be it would have been better if you knew the whole time more than the reveal. But I guess they were, you know, because Moriarty's much more of a Sherlock knows who he is. Right. Like one of those villains the entire time. Right. I, I got to tell you, when I first saw this movie, that reveal flew right over my head because <laughs> I had no clue who Moriarty was. It, it would have been better because how they do it in the Sherlock series is great. If, if he revealed it during that recording, it, it was explaining everything. But you know, at the same just time, there. at the same time, it doesn't mean anything. It does. No, Sherlock Holmes isn't here. Right. Exactly. You know, like, yeah. like, it's really a big reveal for people who care about literary characters. Right. Like yeah. the Star Trek Into Darkness, the big reveal was that Benedict Cumberbatch is Khan. Mm-hmm. In that universe, that means something. If he, <laughs> right. if he re- reveals himself to be Khan in the imitation game. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> It'd be interesting. Yeah, but like, it's like, okay, well, Spock's not here. No one gives a shit. <laughs> no, I think a better reveal would have been he was the guy who killed Quartermain's son. There you go. Yeah, yeah. that is like one of the few things that they do not pay off. Like no. about his son. Besides right. Besides the it, whole Tom Sawyer bullshit thing. Exactly. It's like, well, you're sort of young, so now you're my, you're replacing my son in my life, right. boy. Right. And when we do a sequel to this, you're I mean, going to be the lead. Yeah, I think that's what they were really hoping for. It would be, and I'm sure I know he was really banking on that. The guy who played Sawyer, that he would be the lead in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen too. Right, because uh, that would have been that would have been the Justice League of this, right? Because the end of Batman v Superman, you see the dirt rising off of the of Superman's grave, which was here totally earned, by the way. <laughs> that and death. here it's the same exact ending. Yeah. Are we sure Snyder didn't produce this? Maybe he, he just stole it. So he's not exactly a genius now, is he? He just stole things off the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Quiet, Ant. We don't need that kind of heat. <laughs> we bash him every week. Yep. <laughs> they get the jump on him, and it's revealed that he's James Moriarty. A guard shows up, and Sawyer manages to fight him off, but Moriarty gets away in the melee. Harker finds Dorian Gray, and they fight. Both of them have regenerative properties, so even though they get some hits against each other... And none of, nothing happens. Eventually, Gray gets the upper hand and runs the, through Harker with her, his sword. Sawyer and Quartermain chase after Moriarty, and they are stopped by an invisible man, but not Skinner. Sawyer battles the invisible man for a time, and then the invisible man runs away. But then a mechanical man with a flamethrower chases after him. So it's set everything that he can find on fire, but then Skinner shows up and helps him by pulling the hose on the flamethrower, but he gets set on fire. Was there any point, because I had the captions on, because I, I have to watch movies that way. Was it revealed to you guys if you didn't have the caption on who the other Invisible Man was? I don't think Did so. Say I think it just says point? man on it. No, because I know who it is. It says it in the closed caption. Oh, does it? I don't, yeah, I it's, don't the, think... it's the guy that comes and meets Quartermain because it says Reed with a colon. No. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, I don't think they did. Hmm. Good for that guy, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 
And it, with Harker fighting Dorian, if he knows her, he knows she's a vampire, right? I think so. So he saw he, her. He saw her eat people. Yeah. He, she bit off the bit that one guy in in yeah. Gray's house. Right. So wouldn't he know that the only way to kill a vampire is to drive a wooden stake through its heart? Well, I maybe think... maybe that doesn't get to him in terms okay. of the mythos. Or it's one of these things where silver kills him, and that sword is silver. And if you put it through the heart, because she makes she says the line when she wakes up, "You broke my heart before, but you missed this time." Okay. Because I was I you was know. thinking, you know, he's been around forever, and he knows her. I would assume that he would know that the only way to kill her would be the wooden stake. But yeah, yeah maybe you're right. Maybe that kind of mythos doesn't isn't widely known. Yeah. Yeah. So one of Moriarty's right-hand men drinks all of the hide serum and starts to freak out. Meanwhile, Gray pulls a sword out of Harker. And Harker awakens, pins Gray to the wall with a, with his sword, and shows him his painting. So then Gray ages until he decays, and the painting becomes young again. That's the end of Dorian Gray. I don't know if it's like if this was supposed to be what happened, but it looked like she was regretting showing him the painting. I think she was more horrified. Oh, okay. Like, oh my yeah. god, what the fuck is happening here? Mm-hmm. I can the see more... the terrible CGI in front of me. <laughs> Moriarty and Quartermain fight. Nemo and Hyde try to kill the other Hyde monster. Eventually Hyde turns back into Jekyll. It, and... It's interesting, because we he, you know, Hyde's the Hulk, right? Yeah. So this was way before this came out, but the other henchman is essentially the Red Hulk. Yep. Because he's red, and he's huge. Yep. Get it? I do. Yep. Perfect. Got it. <laughs> Suddenly, the bombs start to explode right before Quartermain is going to kill Moriarty with an axe because our hero is going to just just hack away at the villain with an axe. <laughs> I would have liked to have seen that. The Great White Hunter just hacking his hacking the guy. No finesse. <laughs> just going straight Jason Voorhees on him. Yeah. <laughs> and the explosion buries the other Hyde monster under rubble. Quartermain stops Moriarty from escaping, but then he turns around and shoots the invisible man that has Sawyer hostage. And then Moriarty stabs him in the back and then runs. So Sawyer takes Quartermain's gun and shoots Moriarty from long range. And the formulas of the superhumans fall into the water and Moriarty dies. And so does Quartermain. So that part kind of confused me. Because remember, he's doing the Sawyer's doing the target practice on the Nautilus. Mm-hmm. He misses. Like Connery says he's close, but he misses and he doesn't get another shot at it. So this time, second shot, second attempt, he gets him. Yep. It took so, his time. I guess so, but that it doesn't feel earned mm-hmm. uh, to me, at least. I, I think just it's your second attempt and you get the guy. It just doesn't seem right. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Like, he's that much better now. He misses, like, every shot he takes. Yeah. You just got lucky on that one. I guess. I don't know. It just didn't, I didn't like it. It would have been better. Captain Clutch, man. Fourth quarter. <laughs> he's the captain. No, I, I just, I don't like the idea of Sawyer as a character in general. Yeah, I think it would have just been better if you lifted him out of the movie and let Quartermain be that guy. Mm-hmm. But yeah, neither here nor there. I, I guess he needed to have an American in there for whatever reason. For the U.S. markets. I guess. But he I don't <laughs> think he's even in the the Alan Moore comic. I don't know. I'm not sure. I've never read it, but I don't from what I was looking at, I don't see anyone by that. That looks like Sawyer. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess. And also maybe tying it into I don't know why they made him a Secret Service agent. But just having the name Tom Sawyer, because I aren't all these people like English, like heroes. And yeah. Tom Sawyer would be in, like you said, an American thing. Yeah, so he, probably wouldn't be in the Alan Moore novel. He's not. He's not. It's yeah. Uh, but I'm saying that's the reason like Moore was mostly concentrated on European English literary people. And in this movie, they just threw in, hey, we got to get an American actor in this. Dorian Gray's so, not even in it. So I don't know why they chose him. Very weird. It's Mina, Alan Quartermain, Nemo, Jekyll, Invisible Man, Orlando slash Roland, Thomas Karnacki, A.J. Raffles, Emma Knight. So that that is the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen that was written by Alan Moore. I'm sure everyone is very upset that those other people were not in the movie. <laughs> Back in Africa, the League has a funeral for Quartermain. As they leave, a medicine man starts chanting over Quartermain's grave and the ground starts to shake, just like Superman. That's the end of the movie. That's the end of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Killed the career of the great Sean Connery. And R.I.P. And the director, Stephen Norrington. Yeah, we could... Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was bored. Cut 20 minutes out of it. 90-minute movie. That's all I needed. 
I didn't hate it more than I hated Outcast, but bleh, yeah. I'll never watch this movie again. Yeah, I think the only thing that would make this better would be if you it felt like it could have very much been one of those short British like mini series TV shows, like where you could have explored a little bit more of the characters and maybe gotten a better villain and stuff like that, you know, rather than trying to condense everything with all these at least sort of should be well-known literary figures and giving them only less than two hours to kind of, because everybody's got to be able to buy in from the jump of who these people are. At least with the TV series, you could at least make it a little better and less CGI. So longer is what you're asking for. <laughs> yeah, but not not all in one movie. I'm not talking about 10 minutes. It's on brand. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Dan? Again, I don't hate this movie. There is definitely ways to make it better. I think you can choose. There are way more interesting literary characters out there other than, you know, Dorian Gray, Mina Harker, Alan Quartermain. That'd be uh, public domain, though, bro. That's, you know, yeah, I guess. But I, I thought it was based off of, you know, the comic. So was that all he could do, Alan Moore? He could only Probably. take. Safely. Uh, yeah. There's a reason why Disney keeps fighting the Mickey Mouse copyright. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense, but... Because then Mickey Mouse would end up in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. <laughs> That's just oh. exactly the reason. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking at a list of... I don't know how true this is. This is on Wikipedia. But someone put Mr. Toad in there. I would have loved to have seen Mr. Toad in the, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Because <laughs> that is just so fucking crazy. That would be so wild. Jekyll and Hyde and Mr. Toad just taking down Germans. Yeah, no, I, I don't hate this movie. You lift out Sawyer... You make the Mr. Moriarty could be anyone else, essentially. He could be any other bad guy. He can make up a bad guy for all I care. But it, yeah, I agree with Anne. It really doesn't make sense to have him be the villain because Sherlock Holmes, fucking Watson's not even in this. So there's no tie to that universe. Yeah, to me, it doesn't make sense. But this is early 2000s comic book movies where it's not supposed to be taken seriously. You know, you have uh, Daredevil, you had, you know, the Blade movies. They were OK. I like the first Blade movie. The other ones are terrible. Ghost Rider was around that time. So, yeah, this movie was if this movie comes out post Iron Man, it probably does a lot better and makes a lot more sense. But it was a product of its time. Sure. Yeah, I've got nothing else to say. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry you don't like this. It's it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. It's more bland than I thought it was going to be, though. So, like, so while it wasn't terrible, it wasn't, it was also less interesting, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's not, it's not like one of those things where you're glued to the edge of your seat, for sure. But... Well, yeah, I think there, it hits that medium, like, I didn't gain anything from this. Not even, like, a so bad it's good way, yeah. I guess. Like, the CG was spotty at times, but not, like, so, holy shit, that's ridiculous, but... It was a movie I watched. That's really what I came away with. No, that's fair enough. I think that's a fair assessment of this movie. Yeah. I, it's thing. I don't. To me, it. I. I get how they're saying it was. Um. The way they were. The. The experience overall that made them quit. But just from a viewer's standpoint, it doesn't seem like it should have been a movie where Sean Connery just throws his hands up and he's like, "I'm out of here. I'm done with this whole acting thing." <laughs> but again, I. From what you were saying, it's more of the experience. At least, uh, at least for the director. I would love to see like a Superman Lives documentary on this to see how bad it was. Yeah. Because it, like something that caused one of the legendary actors of our time just call it call it over, hung up his his acting career. Yeah. I think that's worth exploring. Sure. Do a series of it. Yeah. We'll do like we'll do this. Welcome to Mooseport for Gene Hackman. <laughs> Right. New, uh, well, they, Xanadu I mean, they... was uh, what's his name's uh, last movie? Oh, Gene, no. the dancing guy from Singing in the Rain. Gene Kelly. Gene Kelly. Gene Kelly. Uh, it's but I, they did something stupid for uh, Man on the Moon. We had to see what kind of train wreck that was. Oh, the for Jim Andy, Carrey. The Jim Carrey Andy Kaufman documentary. Yeah. Where Jim Carrey just comes off as a giant asshole. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Like we get to see that, and no one gives a shit about that movie. Yeah. I think more people probably was, care about leave it, at least the same amount as as Man on the Moon, right? Possibly. I don't know. Yeah. Was Island of Dr. Moreau Brando's last movie? I don't know. Was that before Superman? So. 
Because I, I think, think Superman was one of his last ones. No, Brando died in circa 2000-ish. Did he? But was he acting? So he died in 2004. His last movie was The Score. Oh, okay, so that's way after. Yeah, he died eight years after Island of Dr. Moreau. Okay, so he was still showing up in stuff in 2006. He had voices. Yeah, Big Bug Man. It was the last known credit. And Mr. he was in Sour. a Michael Jackson music video. Oh, he was actually Rock Mrs. Mile. Sour. Yep. You guys want to plug your shit? Yeah. Yeah. Real quick. But first, I want to thank everyone who donated or hung out with us for our Extra Life campaign over the weekend. That w- We had a lot of fun. Uh, thank you to Mark for, uh, you know, getting everything set up. Thank you for Anthony and Tom for hanging with us virtually. I don't know how you guys stayed awake, especially Anthony st- laying on a bed for 24 hours and not falling asleep. That's impressive. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for hanging out. You can still donate, by the way. Mark will run that down. But uh, you can follow me at Diaquino122 on Twitter. I also run the Stranger Damies Twitter account that is at Stranger Damies. We are at 1,300 followers. We're closing in on 1,500. And we're thinking about possibly doing a giveaway at 1,500. So if you want some D&D swag, come follow us and, you know, see if you get anything. Yeah, so... Yeah, and we uh, also have other podcasts here on the main Damie family of podcasts. We have Stranger Damies, which is our D&D podcast that airs every Wednesday. And um, if you haven't heard by now, we're in the uh, the home stretch for the campaign. Um, we had a big conclusion at the end of the Extra Life campaign, uh, or, or the Extra Life session. Um, so not giving any spoils away for that. But, um, you know, we're going to be wrapping that up pretty soon. Uh, probably by the end of the year, episodes wise, if you're following out on the podcast. Um, uh, so you can find it by searching Stranger Damies. And then you can um, find us on Instagram and Twitter um, at Stranger Damies. Um, uh, so that is the best place to follow um, as we uh, transition into a campaign, too, which will probably be coming live in January. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and then we have our uh, video game podcast, uh, The Game Vault Pod, um, that airs every other Monday. Um, so just keep a track at, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook now, um, Game Vault Pod, um, for when the episodes go live. I know we had a little weird scheduling because, uh, our regular scheduled episode would have been the Monday at their extra life and there would have been no way we would have been able to record it, um, <laughs> given, given the, uh, situation, um, on that Saturday. Uh, so just keep check out there. Um, we also stream multiple times a week. Um, Wednesday, Thursday, and then alternating um, every other Monday, and then Friday and Saturday alternates, um, depending on the uh, whatever day. If we do Monday stream, then we have a uh, Friday um, Dead by Daylight stream. If we don't stream on Monday, then it's a Saturday Dead by Daylight, because we record the Game Ball Pod on Friday. Um, And then we also do um, Sundays, which is uh, usually me and Dan's uh, night. Uh, Jen tags along um, sometimes. Uh, where we just play grab bag of games. Um, we've been hopping around. We did some Dead by Daylight, some Phasmophobia, um, you know, some uh, uh, Call of Duty and stuff like that. It's usually just the wind down week for the stream um, where we can test out some things and not be beholden to a, um, a certain game. Um, so just everything is Game Vault Pod, um, except when you search for the podcast, you have to spell out the full name, which is the Game Vault Podcast. So be sure to check that out. And uh, Extra Life, as Dan mentioned, if you still want to donate uh, to our campaign to raise money for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, you can go to tinyurl.com slash extra life, the number five. Um, you can do it between any time between now and uh, December 31st, 2020. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're trying to get to $1,000. Um, we have three goals that are still outstanding um, at $600 because we're at 535 right now. Um, I will have to give a tour of my uh, setup here. Um, which the only fun part about that is my wire situation will make Tom cry. Um, so <laughs> I'll get him on Skype for the video for that. Um, and then at a thousand, I am getting a uh, a Triforce tattoo um, once we cross the goal at a thousand. And then the most important goal of all, twelve hundred dollars, is to have Tom uh, play PT with headphones on. Um, so if any of you caught the highlight from the stream where he found a loot box in Call of Duty that had a mini jump scare in it. And his reaction to that, just imagine an entire 40 minute experience of him having headphones on in that environment. And Ant can attest to 
um, how creepy that game is, even for somebody that likes horror. Um, <laughs> so I can't imagine Tom doing it, but we really want to see it. Uh, so once again, it's tinyurl.com slash extra life, the number five. Okay. And that's going to wrap this up. We are They Called Us a Movie. You can find us at they called us a movie.podbean.com and wherever you get your podcast, just by searching They Called Us a Movie. We're part of the Main Damien Network. You can find us, find us at the Main Damien.com and on all social media at the Main Damien. So that's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Just look for the Main Damien and we will be there. We're also a proud member of Geek Fives Nation. You can find them at gvnation.com and on all socials and uh, podcast streaming apps just by searching Geek Vibes Nation. Bunch of great shows on there. T- Top Down with Tia, Geek, uh, Gutting the Sacred Cow, Geek Vibes Live, uh, Seeing the Nerd, a whole bunch of great shows. There's certainly something for everyone. And that is going to wrap us up. The director is Stephen Norrington. So for Dan Aquino and Mark Myers, this is Anthony Lavecchio telling Stephen Norrington, the director of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, well, you certainly made a movie, didn't you? 